Well, good morning. If you would, grab your Bibles and turn to Daniel. Daniel, and rem remember, if you get hot, we got fans in the back, all right? So uh, grab one, fan it. Uh, it's a little bit better today. It's a little cooler outside, so hopefully we can grin and bear it, all right? Daniel chapter 9 is where we're going to be today. Uh, let me give you just a little bit um, of an announcement, just a reminder that this Saturday is four-day. So we want you to be a part of Four Day. It's our annual time that we come and we do many projects around our community. We want to be the hands and feet of Christ. We want to love and serve our community. <clears throat> and so we have various uh, types of projects that you can get your hands dirty or you can just, if you want to give out a, a gas card or go grocery someone just for free, if you love to talk to fence posts, I got a job for you, all right? So... Yeah, y'all don't like. Have y'all never heard that? You, you talk so much, you can even talk to a fence post and be okay. Like, oh, okay. So that was an old Tennessee phrase, uh, Middle Tennessee phrase. All right. Anyway, uh, so grateful that you will be a part of. It. Some of you have already registered. We want you to register. Go online, register. That way, we have an idea of how many people are coming, because uh, we have a lot of projects to do, and we want everybody to be involved. So be here eight o'clock. Uh, and we'll, then we'll disperse from there, okay? All right, Daniel chapter 12 uh, is, I'm sorry, tra chapter 9 is where we are this morning. Uh, we're, we're coming down to the end uh, of our walk through Daniel. And today I was supposed to get through two chapters. It did not happen. So we're going to extend uh, Daniel one more week, but we'll just get through chapter 9 today and then work our way through the other chapters. And so Daniel chapter 9 is where we are. We are in the second part of Daniel. The first part is the man or the prophet. We're learning about Daniel, learning about his life and what happened. Now we're in the second part. We're seeing the prophecy or the message of Daniel. And we get to a unique kind of uh, passage here in Daniel, and we had seven and eight, which were visions, dreams given to Daniel. And then in chapter nine, we have something a little bit different. And so we'll read that, uh, and then uh, we'll pray, and then dive into it. So Daniel chapter nine, it will be on your screen, but we would love for you to look at your scriptures in your Bible so that you can take your pencil out and underline and, and do all the things. If you don't have one, totally fine. It's always on the screen. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the, numbers, uh, the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from Your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our, and our fathers, and all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us, open shame. As at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all of Israel, to those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us, by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oaths that are written in the law of Moses 
the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there, are, there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written, the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because, of our, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O oh our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to the pleas for mercy and for your own sake. O oh Lord, make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Do not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my, of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at, at the first, came to me in a swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh Daniel, I have come now, come out to give you insight and understanding. Let's, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we love you. You are good and great and awesome. And your words are true to us. They are, they are sweet to our ears. But sometimes, Lord, we, we need understanding we need your wisdom to understand them. So Lord, in these moments, may you bring understanding to our hearts, to our soul, to our mind. May your words rise to the top and may my words go away. May you help us as your followers to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Why pray? Why should we pray? Does it matter? Does it matter if we pray? If God is sovereign over all things, why pray? You may say, my prayers mean nothing to this divine timeline, to the purposes and the plans of God of all creation. So why waste time praying when I already know how it's going to end? We already read the end of the story. So why should I pray? I think sometimes we ask these types of questions because we don't know how to pray. Or we don't see the importance of it. There are too many passages in the scriptures of God's messengers, of his prophets, of his disciples, and even of God's own son praying that we know that prayer, that praying is something that followers of Jesus Christ should do. Amen? Right? We should do this. Even 
even if God is sovereign. We, we know that just because God is sovereign doesn't mean that we are not to pray. One author said, if God is sovereign, why pray? He says, it's because God is sovereign that I pray. Since God knows all things, shouldn't we be praying to him? And saying, God, you know all things. Would you help me get in step with you? But see, the problem is, is that our prayers are not like Daniel's. Our prayers often are, Lord, you are our glorified Santa Claus. Would you give me what is on my list? Since God is sovereign, we should pray. And see, this was Daniel. Daniel was faithful to God. Faithful in his work and in his allegiance to the one true God. He was faithful in reading the scriptures and in prayer. We see multiple times in these chapters of Daniel that Daniel prayed. He prayed before interpretation. So he prayed in, in chapter 6. He prayed three times a day as his normal practice. We see in chapters 9 and 10 that he was praying. And the Lord gave him vision. Daniel was a man of prayer. But what we see in 9 and 10 is, is that Daniel continues to seek the Lord even though he knew what the Lord had told him about what is to come. If you remember back in chapter 6 and 7 that, that Daniel had these visions and these visions were showing him what is to come. There is destruction that is coming. There is conquering of kingdoms that are coming. There is even stars are going to fall. In other words, we said last week that even some believers are going to die in this destruction. Daniel, this is what is to come. And then we come to chapter 9 and we see that Daniel is praying. I don't know about you, but it's almost, I, I think my I don't think I'm like Daniel. I think I would have stopped praying. I think I would have been like, there's destruction coming. We see all this happening. I just, I've already, listen, I already see how this is all going to end. I'm not going to pray anymore. God's already got all this thing figured out. I think I'm just going to stop praying. Anybody in my boat? Right, just forget it. Daniel said, because I know these things, oh, shall I pray all the more. God, you know how all this is going to end. You know the destruction of these kingdoms are coming. You know that the stars are going to fall. You know that it might even be me. But God, I am going to pray. And I'm going to pray for what you promised. And that's what we see in chapter 9. In chapter 9, we, we've moved into a new king. So as we said, chapters 1 through 6, is kind of we can kind of plot that along on a timeline. But when we get to 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, we kind of have to say, well, 6 and 7 happened way over here. And chapter 9, that's over here in King Darius. And so we know that during the time of King Darius, in the first year, Daniel had this time. He began to pray. And this was... This, this, this was still in the time of exile, that, that all of Daniel's people were still away from their homeland. Daniel had been reading. First year of King Darius, he was reading the scriptures. Why? To know the Lord and to know how to follow him. This particular day, he was reading out of the prophet Jeremiah. So if you have your Bible... Flip back to the left a, a little bit. Go to the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 25. I want you, it's not going to be on your screens, but I want you to read this with me. I want you to see these are the words that led Daniel to pray what he prayed. And so we read out of Jeremiah, chapter 25, starting in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah... That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah, the prophet, spoke to all the people of Judah 
and all of its inhabitants of Jerusalem. For 23 years, from the 30th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, I'm sorry, the 13th year of Josiah, my, I'm sorry, to Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. You have either listened nor inclined your ears to hear. Although the Lord persistently sent you all his servants, the prophets, saying, turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from the old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands and your, to your own harm. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the, kings of, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. And I will devote them to the destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of the mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the, br the bride, the grinding of the millstone and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the king of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations for many nations and great kings shall make slaves that uh, even of them and i will recompense them according to their deeds and the work of their hands so daniel in his room in his house reading the prophet jeremiah sees these words he says he sees that god has handed over his people to the Babylonians and they were going to be exiled. How many years did it say that they were going to be exiled? 70 years. So as Daniel's reading this, in the first year of King Darius, it dawns on him. Hey, hey, hey wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm reading this, the prophecy of Jeremiah. I'm going to do a little math here in my head. Holy cow. We have almost been in exile 70 years. The time for God to deliver us out of exile is almost here. Daniel has been in exile with his people at this point almost 70 years. And he says, oh gosh, it's almost here. God said 70 years. We've been in it almost that time. It's time for for us to go. Now, what did Daniel do after he read Jeremiah? Did he go pack his bags? Did he go did start taking pictures off the wall and filling in the, the drywall, right? Did it start, hey, Daniel, what are you doing? You got no pictures on the wall. Like, you're, you're painting. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just trying to leave it for the next guy because I'm out of here, right? No, he didn't pack his bags. He, he, didn't, he didn't do any of that. He began to what? To pray. In chapter 9, we're given Daniel's prayer. And we're almost given a, a model of sorts as how to pray. And then what we see at the end of chapter 9 is that God uniquely answers Daniel's prayer. So let's look at this prayer and let's see if we can learn a little bit from it as we begin. So if you're starting off, I see right at the beginning that we are to pray, pray to, to bring honor and to submit to authority. 
Look at verse 4. O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Daniel begins his prayer with an acknowledgement of God and who he is and Daniel's position. Daniel didn't say, I am awesome in your presence, O God. He said, you are great. You are awesome. Daniel's words are words of invocation, words that speak to this authority. But it also speaks to, God, you are the one who can help us out of this tight spot that we have put ourselves in. I think Daniel is right in beginning his prayer like this. Daniel knows that he can't save the people of Israel from exile. He knows that he can't rebuild, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. He knows that God is the one who made the prophecy and he is the only one who can fulfill it. So Daniel will submit to the authority of God's plan and God's will and say, oh God, you are great. You are awesome. You are the one who can answer these prayers. Is this, is this how we begin our prayers? Do we begin our prayers with, oh great God, you are so awesome. Or do we speak of him in such a way that we can put him in a box and say, you are my glorified Santa Claus and I can control you based off of what I say. And listen, I'm coming to you and I'm expecting you to give me everything on my list. And if you don't, I'm walking away. I'm going to stop believing in you. Don't look at me like you hadn't thought that. Don't look at me like you haven't talked to people that say, well, I prayed and he didn't answer. So I stopped believing. I stopped coming to church. Daniel didn't say to God, I think of you in these ways and, 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 and I can compartmentalize, I can put you in this box and I know exactly all the things that you are. No, he uses words that say, God, you are great. You are awesome. You are so far out of my understanding. I cannot put you in a box because you would bust out. You are great. Do we begin our prayers like this? I think we should because Jesus started his prayer like that. How did he start his prayer? Our Father who, is art, who art in heaven hallowed be thine that is a that is a term of glory it is a term of praise it is a term saying you are the great god and that's why jesus taught us to pray do we acknowledge god's glory do we acknowledge god's greatness when we pray ian dugood says it like this if we forget god's greatness in our prayers then our prayers will be too small. You might want to write that down. That was good. If we forget God's greatness in our prayers, then our prayers will be too small. You've heard the phrase, aim small, hit small. I think oftentimes we're, we're just like Ian in this case. He, later, he goes on and later says, Indeed, I find that my own prayers are almost too small. I don't find myself praying for a great and mighty work of God's Spirit in our community and in our day. I don't very often pray for remarkable demonstrations of God's power in our church. I forget God's greatness, that He is the one who created all things out of nothing. The one who hung the stars in the heavens and assigned the seas their boundaries. I have forgotten that he is the one who raises up kings and world leaders and brings them down again. If I remember God's greatness, my prayer life would be radically transformed. 
Oftentimes, we don't pray to a great God. We pray to the God that we have created in our mind that we can control. One of the, great, one of the commandments is, is don't make a graven image. Don't make God out to be someone he's not. So Daniel, after reading the prophecies of Jeremiah goes to God and acknowledges that you are a great God. Even in his prayer, he said, you, you brought us out of Egypt. If you brought us out of Egypt, oh, you can bring us out of Babylon. You see, what was Daniel praying for, though? He was praying that God would rescue his people from exile for God to restore the city of Jerusalem and for his people to go back to their homeland. Are your prayers that big? Are your prayers that big? Daniel's prayers were big. Like, think about this. The, the city of Jerusalem laid in rubble. The walls had been torn down. The temple had been torn down. All the people of Jerusalem, Judea, it was, it was, they were all in exile. And Daniel begins to say, God, you are great. You can do this. Do you know oftentimes we don't pray that God, that, that he, that we don't pray big things because we really don't believe that he can do it. We don't pray for our friends healing or we don't pray for the bad situation that we got ourselves in. We don't pray for these things because oftentimes we think that God's not going to do it anyway, so I'm not going to pray for it. Daniel began to read through Jeremiah and said, I know my God is faithful. And so I'm going to pray about the things that God said he would do. So he begins to pray. Daniel's prayers were big because he believed in the greatness of God and that God would do what he said he would do. Sometimes our prayers end up being big. You say, Lee, I do pray big, but not for the same reasons that Daniel did. We pray big for our own selfish reasons. Not for God-centered reasons. Daniel prayed for God to do his word, his promises. Pray big because God is great. So we pray. We, we, pray, we pray that God would bring us honor and uh, bring honor and that we would submit to his authority but also that we would pray prayers of confession you say well Lee, i do this yeah well think about this listen to daniel most of daniel's prayers are are prayers of lament and confession how often have we been in a state of lament of sorrow of 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 just so sad at our sin. You say, well, we, we, we don't do that too much in our day. Yeah, but there's a whole book on laments. It's called Lamentations. Don't you think God's people should lament don't you think God's people should be sorrowful over what we have done in the sight of God? Most of what we read in chapter 9, the prayers of Daniel, was that his, it was a prayer of lament and confession. He sees in the scriptures that because of the disobedience of his people, they are in exile. And they're suffering for their disobedience. So Daniel prays and confesses for his people. Daniel just, doesn't just say, like oftentimes we do, Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we honor you. Lord, would you just forgive us of our sins? And then you begin to go in to your laundry list of things. 
Have you ever prayed like that? You ever heard someone pray, pray, Lord, just pray for all of our sins. We pray you forgive them. And then we move on. Daniel began to be specific. Which is what I think that we should do. Listen to the things that Daniel said. He said, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. He says that a couple times. We have turned aside from your commandments. We did not listen to your prophets. We, be, we have done treacherous things against you, O God. And he doesn't leave anyone out. It's not like he said, well, it's just a few of us. It's just a few people that got us into this mess. No, he says, he said it was the men of Judah. It was the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It was all of Israel. It was those who were near, those who were far, and in the lands in which they had been driven into. He even talked about people who moved outside the area. And he said, everybody, all of us are to blame for our plight, our, our situation, us being in exile. Daniel says, and, and rightly so, look in verse 7, look at verse 8. Daniel says that we, that we are deserving of what? Open shame. Open shame. So maybe some of you have, have those those sins, you have those things in your life that you just kind of keep close to your chest because if anybody knew about this, I would be embarrassed. There would be open shame upon me and my family. Daniel prays to God. We are the ones who deserve open shame because why? We have sinned against a holy God. He says this twice in verse 7 and in verse 8. We are the ones. And he says, who deserves this? Our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and all of us. We deserve this open shame. We have done all these things. We have sinned. We have rebelled. We've acted wickedly. We are in, we are in need of prayers of confession. Just as Daniel prayed these prayers, we could echo these and say, we have rebelled. We have acted wickedly. We are in need of prayers of confession. Prayers of acknowledging that we deserve open shame and that we are in need of forgiveness. Sometimes, Let's take our first point, let's take our second point, let's add them, let's put them together, and let's say that sometimes we have that sin that is so deep that we, and it's, it's plagued us for so long that we think our God is not big enough to forgive it or to take care of it. But our God is big enough and that we are the ones who deserve open shame, but we, we, we know that He is the only one who can forgive us and heal us from this sin or sins. But yet we don't go to him. We don't go seek help for it because we're not willing to say the things that Daniel said. We are the ones who got us into this situation. Daniel didn't blame anybody else. Daniel didn't say, God, you did this to us. No, he said, we have sinned against you. Our fathers, our forefathers, our, our kings and princes, our, those who have scattered, those who are near, those who are far, we have done this to ourselves. Sometimes we ask the question, why are we in this mess? Why are we in this mess? God, why have you allowed this in my life? And God's saying, you got there on your own, big boy. Don't blame me. You, let me, let me, let's, let's rewind the tape. Stick the pencil in the tape. Let's rewind it a little bit. That was a... Some of y'all don't get that. <laughs> Push the button on, the, uh, uh, on your phone to go backwards. T take YouTube and double click on the left a little bit. And let's go backwards. And I want to show you. This is what you have done. You have openly 
uh, rebelled against me and my words and the pastors and the prophets and the preachers that have come before you and said, don't go down that road. You did it anyway. And now I said, if you do it, this is what's going to happen. And did it come true? Yes, don't blame me. I was the guy standing in the road going, don't go down the road. It's closed. It's closed. And you went right around me and went off the cliff. I would even say that you don't even need to blame the devil. I hate that phrase. The devil made me do it. No, no, you did it. You did it on your own. You didn't need no help from anybody else. Your flesh is wicked. It's sinful. And you did this. You went after other things. You abhorred yourself. You, you, you rebelled against God. If our understanding of God is great and our understanding of ourselves is that we are sinful, then our prayers should be that of humble confession. We say you are great and we are not. Some of us have pride issues. That's why we won't ask God for help. Daniel went to God humbly and said, we have sinned. If God is so great, then he is the one that we should seek with all of our problems, with all of our requests, with all of our petitions. And just remember that if God is so great, then your sin is not greater. Grace, grace, that is greater than all of our sin. Third thing I want us to see is that we should pray that your will will be God's will. Daniel prayed. And in that prayer, Daniel prayed that God would do what he said he was going to do to save his people, to restore the land, to rebuild the temple. Daniel prayed that God would listen to the cries of the people, that his anger would be turned away from them. He prayed for his face to shine on the sanctuary again. All these things God had promised. Daniel didn't have to remind God of the promises, the, the covenants that he made with his people, but Daniel needed the reminding. You know that when you pray the scriptures, you pray back the promises to God, it's not because you need to remind God, hey God, you remember you said that you would do this. He's going, I hadn't forgot. It's you who has forgotten. Daniel needed to be reminded. And he also needed to pray so his will would be in line with God's will. We can pray wrongly, amen? Amen. We can try to get, we can try to make God submit to our will. We can say, God, this is what you should do. I know what is best for my life. I know what is best for my kids. I'm praying that this is my will. God, would you change your will to be in line with my will? Now, we don't say it that way, but we do. And Daniel is not praying, oh, Lord, would you do my will? He's praying, oh, Lord, would you do your will. Let my will line up with your will. So Daniel prays. See, we can seek to see our will become God's will instead of God's will becoming ours. So, so Daniel prays for God to do what he promised. These are his petitions to God. He, he petitions, he requests that God would do what he said he would do. This doesn't sound often like my prayers. My prayers often are very me-centered. Anybody else? Well, uh, holier than thou is out there. I, I find myself praying so me-centered prayers that now I go, I'm sorry about that, God. Let me start over. James says in chapter 4, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain it, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask 
wrongly, to spend it on your own passions. You pray for your own passions, your own desires, your own will, your own things. But instead, you should pray rightly so that I, so that I will do what I'm called and I'm, I told you that I would do. Lee, pray my word. Pray that thy will be done. We ask often for our p- passions, our pleasures. And James says those are, that's wrong. Daniel asked for God to do what he said he would do. Why? So that Daniel's heart, his desires, Daniel's will would be that of the Father's will. When we ask God to do what the Scriptures say, then we ask rightly. God will never act out of his character. Amen? And the Scriptures are his words. Amen? So God will never act outside of what his Scripture says that he will do. He will not act against his word. So Daniel prays. He says, you are great. We have great sin that needs to be forgiven. And you said that you would do these things. And I pray that you would do these things. And then God answers, God answers Daniel's prayer in a unique way. He answers those prayers in a unique way. Look, if you look, while Daniel is praying, God sends Gabriel down to talk to to Daniel. I don't know about you, but that's like, that's the red bat phone right there, right? That's like, I'm getting the commissioner on the phone. I got the direct line to God. Lord, I'm praying that you would do what you said you would do. Well, hello, Gabriel. Right? That, I, that would mess me up a little bit, right? And God says to Daniel, I will answer my prayers, answer your prayers. I've heard them. We see him say in, in chapter 10, ever since you began to pray, and that, that was a long time ago, we heard your prayers. Daniel begins to, uh, Gabriel begins to tell Daniel that God will answer these prayers. But I think we can break down this section that can be kind of confusing to some. This this section uh, at the end of chapter 9, from 24 to the end, I think we can break this down into God telling Daniel that I can answer your prayers. And I will answer them in the immediate and in the ultimate. I will answer these immediate prayers that you have. But I will also answer the ultimate prayers that you haven't prayed. Because you don't know to pray. Gabriel gives a list of things that the future will hold. Things that will happen in the immediate and some that will happen in the ultimate. Let's say it this way, that God told Daniel that his immediate prayers will be answered, but this is not the ultimate purpose of all of this. God is looking at Daniel saying, Daniel, I am going to do what I said I was going to do, but that is just a little blip on the radar of what I've got planned throughout throughout time. Yes, I will save my people from exile. Yes, that is a big deal. You need to sing about it. You need to write about it. You need to praise me for it. But that's that's, that's not even the biggest salvation of God's people that will come. See, there's coming one, not in the immediate, but in the ultimate, that will save all my people from their sins, from sins past, present, and future, and will save them for all of eternity. This right here, Daniel, is the immediate, but the ultimate is coming. Daniel didn't even know to pray for things beyond the immediate. Sometimes we don't, need to, we don't even know that we need to pray beyond the immediate. Amen? The immediate is this. It's, it's right here. It's like all we can see is this right here. Lord, would you get us out of exile? Would you get us out of exile? Would you get us out of exile? And God says, yes, I'm going to get you out of exile. But you have a greater need. And that need is for you to be saved from your sins. 
so he says in these he, he gives a list of things but we see right before right after that in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 it is the first reference to the to the Messiah in the Old Testament if you look at verse 25 the, the word there uh, anointed one there's this anointed one that will come. Well, guess what the word for the anointed one in Hebrew is? Messiah. When he comes, when this anointed one will come, he will do these things. Look at what the Gabriel says that these things are going to happen. He says, and decreed about your people, verse 24, in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Now therefore, and understand from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem in the coming of, of, the, of an anointed one, a prince, that would be seven weeks. Gabriel says to Daniel, Yes, God has heard your prayers. He will do these things. He promised that he would do them. But Daniel, there's oh so more. There is an ultimate issue that is at stake, and that is that, that God is going to work all these things for, the, for you to be saved from your ultimate enemy. Is that Rome? Is that Alexander the Great? Is that communism? Is it fascism? Is it any government? Nope. It's sin. And, and Gabriel says, listen, he will come and he will finish the transgression. Why do you think Jesus said on the cross, it is finished and then it's and then gabriel says that he will put an end to sin have we have is sin still going on so that's to come amen there was coming a day when christ will come back the second time set up his new kingdom on on the earth and he, he will rule and reign and there will be no more sin no more sin no more sorrow. No more sickness. And then he says, and he will atone for the iniquity. Has Christ atoned for our sin? Yes! The, the anointed one came and died for our sins so that we can have freedom from sin. Our ultimate enemy is not Babylon, Daniel. It's not King Darius or Nebuchadnezzar. Or Belshazzar. It's, it's not that. I'm sorry, Belshazzar. Belshazzar, that's Daniel's other name. But it, no, it's not these gods. It's not Hitler. It's not China. It's not Russia. It's not anything else you want to fill in the blank. It is sin, Daniel. And I'm sending my own son so that you can have freedom, ultimate delivery from ultimate salvation from your greatest enemy. Wouldn't you like Jesus to answer your prayer that directly? So let us be comforted by this. Let us be comforted by these words that Christ will fulfill the prophecies that he has said. He will do his word. Amen? And if God will do his word for the Israelites and pull them out of Babylon and put them back in Jerusalem and build up the walls of the city and build the temple again, do you not think that he will rebuild the temple that, was, that died one day and three days later it would be rebuilt? Do you not think that he will enter into a holy relationship with his people in another way, through, and, and live in the temple that we are known as our bodies. Holy, the, the New Testament says what? He doesn't dwell in temples made by man. Christ will come, and he will be our ultimate 
price, our ultimate Savior for our sin today and our future sin so that one day there will be no more enemy. Don't look at this and be confused. Look at it and say, oh God, may you change my prayers. May I pray like Daniel. And even if you don't answer me like Daniel, listen, you know what? Don't even pray that. Don't even pray that. God, thank you for answering me like you answered Daniel. You gave me direct words about how I should live my life and how I should worship you written in black and white. Thank you for directly answering my prayers. Now may I listen and may I do what you've asked me to do. Some of you today, maybe you haven't prayed in a while because you don't believe. You don't believe in Christ. Your immediate need is for salvation. And I would hope that today that you'd place your faith in Jesus Christ. That you'd repent of your sin. That you would turn from, from your sin. And that you'd place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That you'd believe that he did die for you. That he didn't just die for a large group of people. That he died for you. And that you can be saved from your sins today. That today your immediate need can be taken care of. That you can be free from your sin. You can be forgiven. And that ultimately you will live forever with Christ in everlasting and everlasting. Let's pray. God, we love you. We're so grateful that you hear and answer our prayers. May we trust in you. May we read your word and understand it so that our prayers become great. Not because we are being selfish, but because you promise great things. So Lord, we pray big things because you're a big God. And today we pray that you would save those in the room that do not know you. That you would open their hearts and minds to understand that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to you except through Christ. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. If you signed up for Essentials, just hang out for a little bit. We're getting food set up. If you did not, we'll see you next week. God bless you.